Good day, this is Zafar Mohamed Gauss uh, interviewing Alistair Hart, one of the entrepreneurs who has made a disruption, yes we can, with his passion to positioning technologies and be able to go and talk to clients on the use of his uh, innovation models and, and, and the trends that come across to Australia and, and try to provide insights on how it's going to make a difference in their workflows. Alistair, welcome. Thank you very much, Safar. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, Alistair, it's, I've always seen you as a passionate uh, young uh, entrepreneur, if I can use that word. Um, can, we, can you just share with your experience of uh, how you have uh, disrupted a client uh, using the, uh, introducing the positioning technology and how they benefited? Actually, it's a far, uh, look, a really great example was just yesterday when we were out on an almond farm in the northern Adelaide Plains. And this almond farmer has historically used GPS-only Trimble hardware, consuming a correction from the Australian Maritime Safety Authority's differential beacon service. And that service was switched off two years ago. And I was having a phone chat with this farmer and he asked me, don't you do something with GPS? Can you help somehow? And so we've been able to provide him with our relatively low cost but very capable GNSS receivers and in those receivers he's been able to configure the um, messaging of the positioning stream such that it can be accepted by this legacy 20 year old hardware. So we're talking Topcon spray control units that he's buying second hand on Facebook, on precision farming, precision agriculture Facebook groups, buying them at incredibly low cost, installing them in his orchard tractors and using them to ensure that there is an even and consistent application right across the um, orchard in terms of the um, um, fungicides and etc that are, are necessary to grow his crop. So by having access to our um, EMLA GNSS receivers he's been able to deliver you know really dense constellation data, really good positioning information consuming free correction services like Oscores and at a very low cost enable the continued utility of this very old but quite effective spray control technology. So that's sort of an example that perhaps is a little bit um, outside of our core industry focus. Um, the other emerging consumers that we're seeing are local governments actually. So local governments are buying our survey grade receivers and using them to manage the collection of their asset information at much higher levels of precision than they ever did before. So this obviously allows them to more effectively manage um, the relocation of underground assets and um, again it's uh, very easy uh, to use and a simple workflow so they're not really needing to invest the same levels of money in consulting expertise for people to come in and deliver that precise positioning outcome. So it's a little bit disruptive and, and in some ways contentious, um, but it is certainly very enabling for um, sectors of the economy that previously haven't been able to access this level of positioning precision. Uh, this is a great example of tech and data for good and, and I think the user story that you articulated with the farmers is about uh, one farmer benefited and how about reaching this out to the other farmers and I think it's also about the cost effectiveness that you have articulated is those user stories are very important uh, because uh, the technology that comes across needs to be affordable and also be practical and that's a great use case. Coming back to your asset uh, example, the second use case. Um, there are certain forums that you know asset owners be it is utility or or uh, whether in utility water or electricity. Um, how do you communicate to these asset owners on on influencing a good use of technology for productivity? Because often uh, the asset capture uh, is kind of an environment that it's a well-oiled machine. Uh, they have their own regulatory process. So how do you bring the ice. Yeah, you know, it's actually a really interesting thing. So a lot of people come to me to talk to me about the hardware that we sell and they don't realise that underneath that I've got a burning passion for improving information right across the asset data information life cycle mm -hmm. from the commissioning of the asset all the way through to the disposal of it. And when we scratch the surface, as I did with a utility company here today, what we find is that despite being highly regulated, 
um, there are some mythical qualities about the um, well-oiled practices of our utility companies. So some companies do it very well and other companies are still really struggling with the, um, the, the management buy-in and more significantly the buy-in of the people on the front line, you know, the guys down in the trenches that are managing the utility data on a day-to-day -day basis and having them to properly understand the value of good quality as constructed information that is accessible across the organisation and attributed in a way that supports all of the different business units that leverage asset information to support their processes all the way through from forecasting to design, construction, maintenance, disposal. There's so many different aspects to that asset data management life cycle and it's very rare for organisations to actually have a cohesive culture where that life cycle is complete and respects the codependencies of the other business units. Uh, this brings to the point about the positioning literacy, isn't it? Um, positioning literacy, how do we make aware, uh, especially across all tiers, especially taking the asset uh, uh, practitioners, uh, because this literacy is not about they are embedded into their workflows. Uh, is there a strategy uh, and how can your company uh, contribute to this literacy of positioning? So I guess some of the work that we've done in the past with some utility managers is to help them to properly document what their business requirements are, to help um, to gather all of the different stakeholders together to talk frankly um, about all of their different business requirements across those life cycles. And just through that an initial consultative process where we start to document the existing um, asset information management life cycle and where those gaps are, people start to begin to comprehend the dependencies of other areas of their organisation on information that they may be responsible for the collection and management of. And I think beyond that, there are a number of strategies in terms of challenging the um, existing information that's being collected. Is it of value or are you collecting it because that's what someone told you to collect? And what information aren't you collecting that actually would support a legitimate business requirement in the organisation? And once you've properly documented those um, business requirements, the um, intended asset data management life cycle throughout the organisation that respects the needs of everyone, and you've created appropriate um, you know, data libraries to support and, and processes to support the sustainable collection and management and publication of that data, workshopping it again and doing empathy exercises and role play, which is what we've done with some of our clients, and, and putting engineers in you know, financial asset accountants' shoes for an afternoon and asking them to be a part of the process from a different perspective and helping them to, you know, and, and so everyone's involved in this and everyone's playing a different role to what they would normally play and through that it's intended that they grow their level of empathy and their buy-in and we start to break down that cultural resistance to just focus on what I've got to do to get through my day and help the organisation and its members to adopt a longer term view and to fully engage in the work that is necessary to support that long term life cycle. So these are great uh, experience that comes through. So I know that you have a library of videos that you are uh, uh, sharing across to the community. Uh, do you have any recipes uh, of these success stories that could educate and, and, and help that literacy or knowledge sharing uh, through your programs? Uh, look, it's a great question. In fact, um, just over the last couple of days, we've been doing some site visits with our customers here in Adelaide or in South Australia to begin the process of collecting that. A lot of our existing videos are focused on, you know, how to set up a base station or, you know, and speaking with industry personalities about their perspectives on industry and where the opportunities lie to grow it in strength and capability and capacity. One of our emerging focuses is in communicating the stories of our customers and showing how they have successfully applied that. But we've certainly got a lot more work to do. I don't know that there's any particular recipe, but if I were to try and articulate one, I think the example I would use is, you know, in this you know popular sort of startup and innovation ecosystem sort of culture, we're encouraged to develop pitch decks to have a you know a 30 second elevator pitch. What's the problem? You know, what's the challenge? What's the business requirement? And and how 
how do we solve that and, and what are the pains that we're relieving and the gains that we're delivering and I think keeping those in mind while you're trying to develop these videos um, helps to deliver value to the audience. Brilliant. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to, to, to ask you about, and this is a final question, is around how do we create entrepreneurs like you picking up positioning services and create an ecosystem? Because folks look at you as a role model. What's an advice if university graduates, they come up, rather than looking at jobs, can, 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 can invent or can invest into these sort of entrepreneurs opportunities? Any advice? Look, the, it's difficult. Um, the first thing I would say is um, don't think too much about it or you might scare yourself out of the process. Now, I think if I understood the effort that I've invested over the last eight years, at, if I understood what was required at the beginning of it, I might never have made a choice to go down that path. Having said that, one of the most valuable learning opportunities for me was to get involved in my local business incubator, startups, ecosystem hubs, and they're not focused on our industry, but they provide basic entrepreneurial skills on business model canvases, on customer validation. And I think that's, the, I can't emphasize enough the importance of customer validation. If you're developing a business model and you're preparing to invest in it to acquire customers, you really want to understand what the hypotheses are on which your business model is founded and actually go and test those with real customers. Get out of the building and get some metrics, understand what those hypotheses are, articulate what a critical success factor is and, and what the criteria are to acknowledge that you, you have a successful hypothesis or not and to reiterate through that over and over until you can validate all of your hypotheses and come up with a sustainable business model. And if you do that before you spend lots of money trying to acquire customers, then you're more likely to succeed. Alistair, thank you so much. I think uh, the key message is if you're looking, you're, you're a graduate and you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, look out for Alistair for mentoring and I think he'll be able to share his knowledge and experience to make you a successful entrepreneur. Thank you for joining me, Alistair. No, it's a pleasure, Zafir. Thank you very much for the opportunity and to the viewers of this video, please do feel free to get in touch. We'd love to be able to help to see the industry grow and succeed. Thank you.